Hello, and welcome to the Nursing Home Strategies to Reduce Avoidable Hospitalization, Part 1. My name is Michelle, and I will be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question-and-answer session, and during the question-and-answer session, if you have a question, please press star, then 1 on your touchstone phone. I will now turn the call over to Ms. Christy Wardeen. Christy, you may begin. Thank you very much, and hello, everyone. This is Christy Bergeen with Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network, or Lake Superior Quinn. Lake Superior Quinn represents Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin under the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Quality Improvement Organization program. I would like to welcome you to this educational session entitled Nursing Home Strategies to Reduce Avoidable Hospitalizations, Part 1. All lines will be muted during the webinar. However, after the presentation, we will have a time for questions and answers, so please make a note of any questions that may come up as you listen, or place your question in chat, and we'll address it. This is the third webinar in a series intended to support nursing homes participating in the National Nursing Home Quality Care Collaborative's efforts to improve resident outcomes and reduce hospital readmissions. The first webinar in this series, entitled Reducing Hospital Admissions to Improve Resident Outcomes, Quality, and Financial Incentives. Um, I hope we've all had the opportunity to view this webinar, which provides the context for these learning sessions. This webinar was pre-recorded. It wasn't live, and the link to the recorded webinar, which is 24 minutes long, will be shared at the end of today's session and can also be found on our website. Last week, on August 24th, we presented the second webinar in this series entitled Using QAPI to Reduce Readmission. The recording of that webinar will be available on the Lake um, Learning Session Number 6 LSQIN webpage early next week. During that session, a change of condition process evaluation tool is introduced. Nursing home teams are encouraged to complete this tool to identify process changes that your home may need to focus on to improve communication about a resident's change in condition, which in turn should help reduce hospitalization. The links to this webinar recording and the evaluation tool will also be shared at the end of this presentation. In this webinar, as well as in the final two in this series, we have the privilege of hearing from nursing homes who will be sharing strategies they've implemented to reduce hospital readmissions and improve care for residents. <clears throat> As a reminder, the National Nursing Home Quality Care Collaborative uses this change package as a reference to great ideas and practices from high-performing nursing homes across the nation that have created interventions and maintained positive outcomes for residents and staff. Included in the change package are strategies that these high-performing nursing homes have used to prevent avoidable hospitalizations. You will note that in Strategy 6, Provide Exceptional Compassionate Clinical Care that Treats the Whole Person, there are action items specific to the transitions of care between shifts, departments, and all care settings. Please use the link to on this slide to access the change package. The first nursing home we will be hearing from is Bronson Commons. I will now turn it over to Susan Marinich, the Director of Nursing at Bronson Commons in Michigan, to share the, the great work they are doing to prevent avoidable hospitalizations. Susan? Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Susan Marinich, and I'm pleased to speak with you today about readmission reduction and quality improvement strategies. My contact information is available to you should you have any questions or if you'd like to request copies of any resources and tools after today's webinar. Next slide, please. Here's a picture of our post-acute and skilled nursing facility located in Mattawan, Michigan. Bronson Commons is a 100-bed facility offering both post-acute care and skilled nursing care for long-term residents. Next slide, please. Here you see a list of our post-acute and skilled services. A few of the services we feel most impact decreasing readmissions are our provider coverage with one physician and one to two NPs in the facility, Monday through Friday with on-call time on the weekend. 
IV medications and antibiotics, ancillary and diagnostic services, and respiratory care services. We also have 24 dedicated rooms with walled-in oxygen and suction that accommodate those oxygen needs as well as trach patients. Next slide, please. Our facility has seen significant changes over the last few years with our patient populations. As you can see from the data, we increased our post-acute admissions by 62% in four years from 2013 to 2017. A higher volume of post-acute care patients resulted in a higher risk for readmissions due to a higher acuity, acute changes in conditions, and opportunities for improvement with transition of care. We are on track for 2018 to receive 775 admissions for this year. Next slide, please. We developed a readmission reduction program to reduce the frequency of transfers to acute care and ensure patient-centered care with the right provider at the right time, place, and cost. We have been a part of the State of Michigan Interact pilot program for the last three years. Interact stands for Interventions to Reduce Acute Care Transfers. The goal of the program is to improve identification, evaluation, and communication when a patient has an acute change in condition. We've built upon what we have learned from being part of that project to continue the work and individualize interventions for what works for our facility. Next slide, please. So what is our goal? One more click. Thank you. Our goal is to work as an interdisciplinary team, along with our partners and community, to decrease unnecessary transfers to the emergency department and unnecessary readmissions, which are often costly, as well as physically and emotionally challenging for patients and families. Next slide, please. Our work in improving our readmission rates follows the TDSA format, or Plan, Do, Study, and Act. This is our Bronson PDSA visual. Planning involved exploring what the problem was and ideas to solve it. The Do phase involved data mining, Study phase involved analyzing the data, and the ACT phase is ongoing for us with intervention activity. All of this stems around the acronym STEEP, as you see in the middle of that top circle. STEEP stands for Safe, Timely, Effective, Efficient, Equitable, and Patient-Centered Care. Next slide, please. How will we know um, when our changes have resulted in an improvement? Collecting and tracking data on all of our transfers was the first step in our program. In order to understand where opportunities were and start addressing them, we needed to understand what our current readmission state was. We needed to know who we were transferring out, why, and how much. We utilized the Interact 4.0 hospital rate tracking tool to accomplish this. Several patient-specific data points are collected and transposed into graphs to identify facility readmission rate and trends. The item summary is listed on the screen for you. This data is then analyzed and presented through a quality performance dashboard. Next slide, please. We created a readmission reduction committee that meets monthly. Members of this committee include the medical director, nurse practitioners, our executive director, myself, and nursing supervisors. Our vice president of post-acute care is also an ad hoc member of this committee. During this meeting, we review the items you see on the bullet points for all transfers to acute care. We refer any acute care opportunities for improvement to our partners and create action items for follow-up on our opportunities for improvement. This brings awareness to the program's weaknesses and creates further quality improvement initiatives. Next slide, please. We started with education. Nurse leaders attended two phases of training sessions put on by HCAM on the Interact program. These were focused on data collection, tracking, and trending, along with education strategies for nursing to reduce readmissions. From these trainings, we then rolled out several different education and training sessions with our bedside staff. In 2015, our top readmission diagnosis was congestive heart failure. Our first round of readmission reduction education focused on CHF. 
In 2016, our top readmission diagnoses were upper respiratory infections and urinary tract infections. So our second round of education focused on those topics. All nurses were educated in person through the use of PowerPoint slides, pre- and post-test games, assessment videos, interact care path tools, and case scenarios. All CNAs were then also educated on early identification of acute changes in condition to report to the nurse for an immediate assessment. We also then held focus groups with nurses and patients and family members to educate them on our facility's clinical capabilities. Improvements that were made based on our focus groups were an individualized SBAR form, which you'll see later, and a full review of our medication backup box with medications added for increased in-facility treatment. We continue to review different care path tools at our quarterly staff meetings and are currently in a process improvement project for decreasing sepsis readmissions. Then, for increased evaluation and oversight of care on our high-risk for readmission patients due to respiratory diagnoses, we implemented a respiratory therapist rounding program. Our RT rounds weekly on all patients whom have a diagnosis of COPD, are on oxygen, have a CPAP or BiPAP, or have an acute change in respiratory condition. A respiratory assessment is completed along with a review of all supplies and equipment to ensure they are in proper working condition and at clinically appropriate settings. A review of provider orders and treatments as they pertain to the patient's respiratory status are also reviewed. Documentation is then completed in the electronic medical record, and recommendation of changes or concerns are communicated to the provider or nursing supervisor. Finally, a post-round handoff is provided from the RT to myself. One more click, please. As post-acute and long-term care facilities, as you all know, we are changing with the magnitude of healthcare changes taking place. We continue to see higher acuity patients, along with patients living longer with multiple end-stage disease processes. We have found it increasingly important for advanced care planning to take place in all healthcare settings. I encourage you to reach out to your acute care partners and inquire about their palliative care or advanced illness management care. We work collaboratively with the Acute Care Advanced Illness Management Team, or AIM, to ensure goals of care discussions start in the acute care setting. This aids in assisting patients with advanced illness to make informed choices about their plan of care and goals for quality of life. AIM consults also assist in advanced directives and helping patients to put a durable power of attorney for health care in place. Early and ongoing patient education on their diagnoses and prognosis gives the patient and family realistic expectations for their post-acute care stay and sets up a smooth transition of care. It is then our responsibility at the post-acute care facility to then continue this advanced care planning and goals of care discussion. For example, do they want to be a full code or a no code? What does that mean? Do they want to be transferred back to the hospital setting and for what conditions? Providers, social work, bedside nurses, and nursing leaders are all engaged in these discussions. Another part of our advanced care planning initiative is an educational tool on CPR, which you will see um, at the end of this presentation. Finally, as part of our advanced care planning initiative, we work very closely with a hospice agency to ensure patients' wishes at their end of life are honored. At Bronson Commons, provider engagement with our readmission reduction program has proven to be a significant component. Clinical dialogue and shared referral decision-making amongst myself and the medical director helped to provide a good working relationship. This set the foundation for an environment of questioning and identifying opportunities for improvement in a positive manner. Also, our nurse practitioners round on all post-acute patients weekly. This ensures early recognition of an intervention for acute changes in condition. It also provides increased face-to-face time for providers to educate patients and have advanced care planning discussions. One more click. Finally, our interdisciplinary team collaboration is another critical component of our program. Nurse and provider teamwork during acute changes in condition is one example of this. For all acute changes in condition, the bedside nurse will complete a focused assessment and provide an SBAR report to the provider. The nurse and provider then follow the appropriate care path and determine if the facility can safely manage the patient in the facility and what interventions should be done. In addition, the bedside nurse and or provider will educate the patient and family on what interventions and care the facility can provide to keep the patient comfortable in our facility. We also create a discharge planning process improvement committee and collaborate with our home health agency. In order to improve our discharge process, an interdisciplinary team meets monthly. 
discharge process opportunities for improvement are discussed and interventions are created and implemented. The goal is to ensure a safe, timely, patient and family-centered discharge plan for every patient. To decrease readmissions once the patient discharges from Bronson Commons, we work to arrange the patient discharges at the right time to the next appropriate level of care with the right supplies and equipment and the right support and resources. Our social workers also schedule a follow-up appointment with the patient's primary care provider within seven days of discharge. The Home Health Agency also assists us in this process as we work closely with them on all discharges needing home care. We utilize an electronic referral process, email our daily discharges to their team, as well as have a weekly touch base. This assists in our discharge patients being seen in the home within 24 to 48 hours and receiving all appropriate post-discharge care. Additionally, if the patient fails home care, we can work with them to readmit back to our facility instead of to the hospital if appropriate. I encourage you to reach out for collaboration with your home health partners. Next slide, please. Progress to date. Here's a graph displaying our progress in reducing readmission rates from our facility. We ended 2014 with a 22% readmission rate and ended 2016 at 9.2%. Our 2018 year-to-date through June rate is at 9.4%. Next slide, please. So what are our future plans? First and foremost, sustainability. How can we maintain our current readmission rates with higher acuity patients and a decreasing length of stay and decreasing reimbursement? We believe a high focus on discharge planning will be crucial. A couple more clicks on this slide, please. We have also started discharge follow-up phone calls to check in on patients and ensure they were able to get the necessary follow-up and have the needed supplies, meds, and equipment at home. We also ask about their home health appointment, if applicable, and their primary care appointment. We are just about to start uh, data tracking, trending, and analysis of readmissions back to the hospital after they have discharged from our facility. We anticipate continued work out of that data as well. Next slide, please. Some of our resources and tools I wanted to show for you. A couple more clicks to get all the pictures up there. Thank you. The first two resources are the Interact Change and Condition Care Path pamphlet. This care path shown would be used when a patient experiences new or worsening shortness of breath. It guides the nurse through a step-by-step -step process of assessment, interventions, when to notify the provider, testing that could be ordered, evaluating results, monitoring responses, and interventions to manage the patient in facility. The last picture shows the Interact Change and Condition file cards. This is a decision support tool for nurses on when and what to report to a provider. The first tool, the Change and Condition Care Path Pamphlet, all of our providers and nursing leaders have and are expected to carry those when they are on call, and those are also located in each of our nurses' med carts for their use. Next slide, please couple more resources before we finish up here. Maybe a little bit difficult to see on that screen, but again, these are all available um, should you like to receive them. The first tool is our individualized SBAR tool, Situation, Background, Assessment, and Recommendation. This tool is expected for use when giving a report on any acute change in condition. This tool can also be used for non-clinical reports. The second tool was created by our post-acute and AIMS team as a handout and talking point guide in layman's terms for assisting patients to make informed choices about their code status. We have found most people are not aware of these statistics when making this choice. Next slide, please. Thank you so much for allowing me to present, and I'm happy to answer any questions following the conclusion of the webinar. Thank you very much, Susan, for sharing these great strategies. Some of you may have questions for Susan, and if so, please put them in chat now or enter the phone queue at the end of the session, and we will address them. Our next speaker is Nancy Strotman. Nancy is the Senior Services Administrator at Cuyuna Regional Medical Center in Minnesota. Nancy? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, from northern Minnesota, we are a small community, and if I can have the next slide, please. A small community attached to a critical access hospital that is very busy with an average daily census of 17, they are not using swing beds there. We are their primary referral source. 
They also have clinics in Crosby, this community, Baxter, Longville, and between those, all of those clinics, we see about 70,000 clinic visits a year, and we have another clinic that will open in less than a year in Breezy Point, which is a big resort area north of town. So uh, excited about that for this campus. Next, please. We're a 113-bed long-term care facility attached to the hospital. 31 beds of the facility are dedicated to a TCU, 20 beds to memory care. We are, however, right now in the process of right-sizing to 75 beds. Uh, that is, uh, takes some work to get done. We have orthoclinic expansion coming in, and our community and area is well-served with home health agencies and also assisted living. Our average census for the past three years has been 81. So uh, when the entire campus looks for underutilized space, the care center was the obvious choice. Next slide. Our partners with us on this campus are Home Health Partnership, uh, where they have palliative care and hospice. Heartwood is a joint venture with Presbyterian Homes of Assisted Living and Memory Care. We also have on campus a community paramedic. Next, please. Why would we even consider looking at hospitalization? We got a new hospitalist director here a couple of years ago. And when we were sending people to the emergency room, he would call and say, who didn't have the talk with this patient? I think of the example of a 96-year-old who was full code. And so it gave us pause to take a look and see where exactly do we fall in the readmissions and hospitalization. So we will also look to be a good discharge partner with the ACO, CMS data, and all of those things. And then because the hospital census is high, we have to be ready and care for them as best we can here without transferring back. Prior to our looking at this, it was business as usual, send them. Uh, they And they go, oh, they're back in the hospital. It was just common for us to think that way. But this is a journey we've been on for about two years. Next, please. What are we trying to accomplish? A successful discharge to ensure that supports and services are in place and to send when appropriate and with objective considerations, such as the SBAR, and with a general philosophy that we can do better. So, next slide, please. How does this happen and how will we know when there's a change and it's been improved? Sense to the hospital will be justified. CMS data will be uh, changed. Next slide, please. So, how did we make this happen? We took a deep dive to review any resident who's been discharged or is readmitted to the hospital. Uh, we have a transitional care nurse who works between the hospital and the nursing home. All she does is seniors, and uh, she is the one who will often know if somebody's been rehospitalized and has gone out to the community. One day we had a woman who had been here. She was at home, total care with home care and her spouse, and we had sent her home and on um, discharge we asked every morning. We have an IDT huddle with all nurse managers, our social worker, our culinary uh, res registered dietitian. And uh, we asked, uh, how is it that this resident, after five days after discharge, ended up back in the hospital? And uh, she gave the scenario, and we paused and said, what could we have done differently here? And so in the morning, every morning at these stand-up meetings, we take these apart and say, let's take a look at this. In that very instance, we sent her home with notification that she was new to a cap, and the home care agency got that notification, but never had we verbalized it, and never had we said, you know, she will need the training. It was there as a new order for them, and uh, that is the reason that she ended up back in the hospital. So now we've taken a step back to say, okay, what do we need to do differently in that situation? We have also hardwired the SBAR with nurses when communicating with the hospitalists. 
and we do rounds on scenarios to check their learning and to make sure that they are still on task with that. And we've had conversations with agents listed on the advanced care directive. We had, have had situations where the agent uh, is not strong enough. When the health care directive says that no ED, no ICU, and yet when we call the agent, it is the one particular situation, it is the spouse, and she says, I am so afraid that I will lose him. And in numerous instances, that has ended up in an ED send and ICU, even when we, we have the pulse and everything right in front of us. So the nurse manager had a conversation with this spouse and said, in the future, I looked at the post, and we understand what that means. You do have the right to say, no, we're not going to follow that. But she said, in the future, instead of calling and asking, what do you want us to do, we are going to say, we have looked at the post, we've reviewed all that information, I'm calling to tell you that there's been a change in condition, and he will, we will keep your, your husband comfortable. That has been a change for us and a big um, indicator and a reason that we have reduced our readmissions. We had uh, long-term care residents. There's about five of them in this very same situation where the agent has not been, we call it, say, strong enough or tough enough to uh, follow exactly what the advanced care directives say. Next slide, please. There's an awareness based on we can do it better. And so one of the things that we did was identify when most of our hospital admits occur from long-term care. We have a nurse practitioner on staff five days a week. We have a medical director who is here a day and a half a week as an attending physician. And so during the week, we find that our needs are pretty well managed because they will take call after hours. On the weekends, however, it becomes the hospitalist. And when we drill down, we know that there are one or two hospitalists who will say, send them, uh, regardless of, um, of what the Colston things may say, it's, it's always the agent. And so uh, that has been an aha moment for us and has given us pause to have conversations with our medical director and also the chief medical officer at the hospital. Next slide, please. We have these huddles when there's rehospitalization. We review the chart, pull out the chart, and find out exactly what was the documentation. And do we need to support that charge nurse differently? On occasion, we have even called back when there's a transfer, like let's say in the evening. And uh, I made the call last time, and I asked the nurse, did you feel supported? Were you confident in your conversation with a physician? And she said, yes, that SBAR training has made this so much easier. So now we have well-informed, well-educated uh, nurses who can support their decisions to make the call. A review of the care directive and post happens before any transfer. And we have these audits going on by our nurse educator at the hospital and then, of course, checking with our medical director and CMO about the appropriateness of, of the ask to have them sent to the hospital. Next slide, please. The, we have in this organization the advanced care directive and the posts are posted in the closet of each resident. And they're reviewed quarterly at care conferences and crucial conversations, as I've described, are happening with the advanced care directive agent. Uh, just recently, we had uh, the ambulance came in the front door and was going down the hall, and I happened to be there as I could see their backside as they were going down the hall. And the director of nurses was also came into that space at that time, and she was quite sure which room they were going to because someone was uh, failing quite fast in his CHF journey. And uh, the nursing assistant came to us. She had never experienced someone in crisis before, a resident in crisis. And so I asked, and 
how did you find the response of everything? She said, great, the nurse was right there. And so after that, we checked with the nurse, and she, we asked, did you know what to do? And she said, absolutely, I opened up the closet door, and his pulse was hanging right there, and so I started CPR immediately. She was confident that his wishes were honored, and so we feel really good about that transfer. Here in the state of Minnesota that hit the national or the state newspapers, just last week was an incident in a nursing home in the state where there were four nurses that did did not respond to his request for CPR, the resident's request for CPR. And um, the reasons were I was afraid I didn't know what to do. Um, the other one, another one said that uh, the per person was already too far gone. Another one said that I didn't realize that he wanted CPR, and the nurse, man, uh, nurse practitioner said that uh, she said it was too late by the time she got there, and the person died. And so there, is, of course, was an OHSC investigation around that. And so uh, we don't want to be on that side of the news necessarily, and so we feel confident that our nurses feel comfortable and confident in what they're doing. Our strategy in the future would be to implement Interact within our EMR, which is we use Point Quick Care. We are on a journey of getting that fully implemented with a consulting company, and so that I was very interested to see the information on the prior presenter on the Interact tool. So our data is not real concrete at this time. Next slide, please. Honoring Choices is the advanced care directive that we have chosen in this hospital, and it is also an initiative for the state. Some of the best informational tools there are they, they have information about artificial hydration and nutrition and CPR, and these are good talking points for us in care conferences and things like that with residents. Honoring Choices is built off of Respecting Choices, which began in Wisconsin, and uh, those those resources for families have been very helpful for us in our journey. I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end of these sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Great work. And again, if you have any questions for Nancy, please put them in chat, and we will address them after our next speaker. Our last speaker is Michelle Skolton. Michelle is the ADON and Quality Assurance Director at Rest Haven Care Center in Michigan. Michelle? Hi, thank you so much for um, allowing me to speak today. Um, next slide, please. Um, Rest Haven is located in Holland, Michigan, along the lake shore, and we are a 145-bed skilled nursing facility. Um, we have a 16-bed short-term rehab unit. Um, we have a 40-bed lap dementia unit, a 10-bed greenhouse, and 79 long-term care beds. Um, we're fortunate to have about a 97% um, uh, capacity census, and um, we offer uh, short-term rehab, dementia care, palliative care, and custodial care. Um, I know a lot of nursing home folks are interested in staffing levels, and we operate at about a 4.2 to 4.5 staffing level. Next slide, please. Um, so what are we trying to accomplish? Um, we want to keep residents in-house while providing excellent care. We want to make sure that we're not compromising care or increasing risk to the resident um, by keeping them in-house. Also looking to optimize our financial incentives related to hospitaliz rehospitalization. Next slide, please. So how are we going to know that um, the changes are an improvement? We track our return to hospital rates, and we do that also by utilizing the Interact 4.0 tool, and that's done on every uh, readmission to the hospital. We uh, look at that tool, and we identify if there are any opportunities to prevent readmissions, um, really focusing on um, what could we done differently. Did we educate the family? Did we educate the um, resident? Um, were there any um, sources of equipment or educational opportunities for our nursing staff that were required to prevent that hospital readmission. Next slide, please. Changes that we made um, that resulted in, in improvement. Um, we changed our view from when in doubt, send them out. Um, we were always looking at um, better safe than sorry. 
um, and just looking at why exactly are we sending that resident out to the hospital. Um, it was the resident or the family insisting they go out. Um, nursing doesn't, if did our nursing staff not feel qualified to care for them? Um, were there equipment needs? What was going on? We had our unit manager work with our rehab nursing staff. Um, our staff works on the same unit um, and same, primarily same unit, same shift. So there's a lot of continuity there and relationship development is focused on. Um, our unit manager worked with the nursing staff to ask, what is the goal for this resident? Our, um, as most do, we have that uh, initial care conference coming in, and we are looking at asking the resident and the family, what is your goal? Um, do you, what are the discharge plans? And um, looking at uh, what we can do to help them meet that goal. We look at, is hospitalization really necessary? Um, can we, what can we do, what can they do in the hospital that we cannot do in our facility? And are there skills that the nurses need in order to do that? So we really focused on education uh, for our nursing staff and making sure that they felt confident in the skills that they have and that they feel confident in caring for the, for the residents to keep them in house. Um, educated the nurses on the importance of keeping them um, in-house whenever necessary, and um, educated the nurses to determine the benefit of sending the resident to the hospital versus keeping them in the nursing home. So looking at risk versus benefit. And we worked with the nurses to develop those skills necessary to keep the, the resident in the nursing home. And also educating families and residents on what we can do. Often families aren't aware of the fact that nursing homes can get stat labs. We can do IVs. We do have pulse oximetry um, and other um, other skill capabilities that they don't feel um, nursing homes can do. Um, we educated our physicians. We're very fortunate to have physicians that work well with us. I know that isn't the case for many people. Um, we feel very fortunate we have um, physicians who will help us in educating staff or, and also family members and who will really work as a part of the team. And we, um, we empower our staff to make the decisions regarding um, transferring the resident into the hospital. Um, that's something that we don't have the nurse call the DON to see if they can go to the hospital or not. We want them empowered um, to, f to feel confident in the decisions that they make, and they won't be reprimanded for doing if they make a mistake. Next slide, please. Progress to date. Um, review our systems and processes and each readmission using the, quali the Interact Quality Improvement Tool. Um, at this point, we feel that each readmission was necessary. We feel like our nursing staff has done a good job, and we feel like the education that we've provided is um, really um, key in, in meeting that goal. Um, most of the residents that were sent out required either telemetry or respiratory therapy, both um, things that we do not offer in our facility. Um, we are being continuously being proactive, continuous education of staff, including staff in decisions and empowering them to make decisions have all proven to be very positive tools um, that we will continue to use. And also I think it's very important to partner with your area hospital. Um, we actually gather with our hospital um, on a quarterly basis and just discuss readmissions and what we can do on both sides to prevent that from happening. So um, I think partnering with your um, area hospitals is key. And that is all I have. Thank you very much, Michelle, and thank you to all of our speakers for sharing with us today. So we now have time for questions or comments for the speaker. I don't see anything in chat. So operator, can you remind our participants how to get in the phone queue for questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. If you have a question, please press star, then 1 on your touchtone phone. If you wish to be removed from the queue, you may press the pound sign or the hash key. And if you're using your speaker phone, you may need to pick up on your handset first before pressing the numbers. But once again, to ask a question, please press star 1 on your phone at this time.
And we are standing by for questions now. Okay, so while we're waiting for questions, this is Christy. I, I, have, I just jotted down a few things. Um, so this is for season. You had kind of said at the end that you, you mentioned an electronic discharge process. I was intrigued. Could you tell me a little bit more what, what you mean by that? Sure. So what I was referring to was a partnership with a home care um, agency and that we sent electronic referrals to that home care agency to help speed up the process um, so we're not sending a bunch of um, faxed paperwork through to them. Um, and then in addition to that, we do send them um, a list of our discharges going out that week, and actually it's daily, um, with the information about what their home care needs are going to be, who their primary care provider is, what services they will need. And then we have a weekly touch base with them um, with my social work director and one of their staff so that they can kind of collaborate um, on how much we're going to have going out and what their capabilities are. And then they also do um, kind of a triage system with patients they may need to be seen in the home faster than others, and so they identify that at that meeting. So it's um, not a, a totally electronic process, but it's an electronic referral process through that home care agency. So you just use primarily one home, home health agency, home care agency? Primarily, yes, but that is because we are part of a health system, yeah. and also that home care is part of the same health system. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. And then I had, um, so Nancy from Cuyuna, you had, you had mentioned community paramedics that you use those, and um, I'm just wondering, I'm thinking maybe some of the speakers or some of the participants aren't familiar with that program. Could you just say a little bit about that? Absolutely. Our, our community paramedic is a, a staff person in the ED or in the ambulance area who goes out and uh, does wellness checks, some wellness checks and uh, things like that to people who have been discharged either from here or from the hospital. I can just give you a story that we had a woman who was in the care center here and because of her um, advanced dementia and also mobility, she was a risk uh, for us in, in leaving the facility. And one day when she did, we could not get her back in. And so we called 911 to come and help for support. Well, she was hospitalized for quite some time and uh, then was discharged to home. And uh, they found out during the course of her hospitalization that under the proper medication, she did just fine at home. So this community paramedic every morning went to the coffee shop, got her a cup of coffee, delivered it to the house, and along with her medication. And that went on for over six months. Wow. And so they do that kind of thing. They're doing INR checks out in the field. I'm uh, those kinds of things. Post some post discharge. If someone is at high risk for rehospitalization, they'll go out and check. So it's a service that Medicare does pay some, but uh, it's not fully funded for sure. We just think it's the right thing to do and helps us with that readmission number across the campus. Thanks, Nancy. That's a good well, great, great story. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone with questions in queue? Yeah, ma'am, I have no questions in the queue. Okay. So it looks like there's nothing in chat, so um looks like there are no more questions. Thanks again, Susan, Nancy, and Michelle, for the great information you shared. Hope that got everybody thinking. Um, on the slide here, you'll see a link to the pre-recorded webinar that we recommend you all view. That's the first bullet. There and our next webinars are on September 11th and September 20th, so you'll hear some more strategies from some other nursing homes. You will need to register for these events, and you can find the registration information via the link on the bottom of the slide. And clicking on this link will also bring you to the link to the recorded webinar uh, that will be available early next week, and that was the webinar on using QAPI to reduce hospitalizations that we had on August 24th. You'll also find the communication evaluation tool there um, if you would like to um, 
work on that with your team. We sure do appreciate all of your efforts to improve the quality of care and the quality of life of those living and receiving services in your nursing homes. If you have any questions about this webinar or about the National Nursing Home Quality Care Collaborative, please refer to this slide for the contact information for the lead from your state. As you exit from this webinar, a window will open to a short evaluation. And we're going to also, right now we're putting a link to the evaluation in the chat box. So please take a minute to provide feedback on today's session, and once you've completed the evaluation, you will receive a certificate of participation. The session was recorded, and it will be available on the Lake Superior Quinn YouTube channel in the next week or two. Thank you all for participating, and thank you again, speakers. You did a wonderful job. Have a really great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's teleconference. Thank you for participating. Hey.